A nice day to everybody and welcome to the eighth conversation of the Mining Universality Research Group. Today it is our enormous pleasure to be in conversation with David Scott, the Ruth and William Lubick Professor and Chair of the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University in the City of New York, whom I welcome most cordially. It is fantastic to have you with us, David. Thanks for being here. Our conversation series started during the COVID pandemic as a sort of disaster recovery plan, one might say, and it has since developed to be a way of doing, a practice, a true path into sharing our questions, and thus it has become central for our own work and reflections. In a way, looking back, this seems quite logical. How could we think of reflecting on new forms of universality and a way of being produced in different uh, cultural practices if we do not consider the personalities, the persons, that dare thinking about it. Certainly, we do not do this primarily for identitarian reasons, but rather because styles of thinking are part of the ways of opening up, of connecting to the shared and yet divided humanity. This, I truly believe, David, is a conviction we shared immediately when we met first in Stockholm, where we were invited last summer to be part of the Nobel Symposium on World Literature and the Problem of the Universal. I will never forget how we got lost from the group on our way back from the Nobel Academy to the bus, as we were completely engaged in an exchange on how thought about the human and humanity is driven out of experience, not necessarily in psychoanalytical terms, which we also debated, rather in its inner relation to the times exceeding an individual life. I remember how intrigued I had been when reading your interpretation of Stuart Hall's life and of how his voice had become, as you show, a universal expression of life experience and exile in the long 20th century, even before he would understand this himself. You have expressed this in Stuart Hall's voice, intimations of an ethics of receptive generosity that came out with Duke University Press in 2017, and it is still your long-term project to write a biography of your more than intellectual friend and schoolmate Stuart Hall. I have the intuition that herein, in the, in the link of life forms and reflection, lies your anthropological interest in literature, which is present in depth throughout your entire oeuvre and, by the way, in classical and modernist forms. An oeuvre which is notably dwelling on the borders of disciplines and in which the arts too are, as a praxis of creating, a potential for pursuing anthropological research in a wider sense since years now. Thus, you have been creating exhibitions like Caribbean Queer Visualities in Belfast and Glasgow in 2016 and 17, or Visual Life and Social Affliction in Nassau, Miami, Rotterdam in 2019 and 20, and you have been the curatorial director of the 2022 Kingston Biennial entitled Pressure. Your own work is, of course, deeply linked to a Jamaican experience and to the Caribbean as a post-colonial field of criticism and theory that is not least represented by the eminent journal Small X, which you founded and for which you received the Distinguished Editor Award at the Modern Language Association in 2017. The Caribbean is in a way the magnetic field of your critical reflection on our modernity as you often say, using the singular as a normative or philosophical concept rather than a historical form. A magnetic field then, which has found its geopolitical span from Sri Lanka to the US, from Dar es Salaam, the way you just come back uh, a few times ago, to Berlin, uh, and which is based on post bandung political thought, cultural Marxism, and I would say a philosophy of history 
that understands our present as a decisive, one might say, Benjaminian point of crossing past and future. It was notably your book, Refashioning Futures, Criticism After Postcoloniality, which came out with Princeton UP in 1999, which has had a great impact on our own project. Before the background of major political changes in the world, in this book, you speak of a Gramscian interregnum, which you describe as, I quote, a transitional moment that I shall characterize as after postcoloniality. This has been very important for our understanding of the failed promise of freedom after 1989, which gave birth to neo-identitarian regressions and movements in the entire world. In your later book, Conscripts of Modernity, The Tragedy of Colonial Enlightenment, 2004 with Duke University Press, your point of departure is the fall of a post-colonial world and the anti-colonial uh, utopias into, as you call it, post-colonial nightmares. And of course, speaking of dictatorial regimes and corruptions in the global south. When some were celebrating the end of history, it seemed already clear to you that the project of modernity and in its core universality, the idea of equality and justice, needed to be rethought. And in 2004 you asked consequently, what are the critical conceptual resources needed for this exercise? And your response then was, there is today no clear answer to this question. So let me start picking up this constellation and ask a simple and yet vast question. Where are we now? 20 years after your path-breaking books on a fundamental political and epistemic change, how can we today conceive of these problems, of new forms of universality, of humanity after universalism? Do we get closer to new forms of a utopia? Or in other terms, looking back, what are the spectres of your own books? So here we go with the first vast question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcus, for that um, enormously generous introduction and description of some of my parts. Um, I, I'm 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 always stumped by questions like that, because I will have to say at the very outset that um, it still isn't clear where we go from here. But um, for me, I think, partly because I, I am averse, I would say, to a prescriptive mode of thinking and speaking, I'm, I'm always inclined to talk about the kind of work that um, I think needs to be done to clear space in which one might think differently about um, the past and the present. Uh, and that's, all, that's always been my, uh, the focus of my preoccupations um, to, to ask what kinds of questions the present obliges us in some sense to rethink and uh, to pose. Uh, but having said that, having said that, uh, you know, I recognize um, that there has been um, a persistent question raised to me about the orientation of the work that I've been involved in, whether it's the work around the tragic, or more recently, the work around evil. And that very often it, it, it sustains in some way um, uh, a negative orientation toward criticism, if you like. That, that, it, that, that it is principally, perhaps even primarily, perhaps sometimes even only, a kind of deconstructive um, attempt to dismantle the 
the, the, contem the contemporary structures and powers that have brought us to where we are. And I'm committed to that project. That there is, I think there is no way out of that project. Um, and, and I always like to repeat a phrase which I want from Russell Jacobi that the only way out is through. And, um, and that I feel myself committed to. But having said that, you know, part of the, the line of questioning that for me was opened up in refashioning futures, and I'm still, you know, churning through that, is how and on what terms to redescribe the terrain of political demands that might be made in a present such as it is. I have, um, and this is partly the, the gesture that's made in the essay on, on Walter Rodney, which I um, have recently written and was partly, you know, uh, Dar es Salaam was in the back of my mind for all kinds of reasons that we can talk about. But I do think that it is imperative um, to try now to link the kind of ethics of deconstruction broadly understood, the, the, the effort to, to, um, to ask what the present demands in some particular way, and at the same time to reconstruct a positive kind of um, unguaranteeable, obviously, but, but political questions about justice about transformation, um, about socialism, um, that I think are increasingly urgent. Thank you. Um, I would like to follow up, uh, but reduce uh, the scale of reflection to the more micro level of uh, biography. Uh, in your text about Stewart Hall biography, a sense of displacement, Stewart Hall's art of living, you return to the question of the sense of displacement dear to Stuart Hall and which enabled him, you say, not to conform entirely to the norms of the self and of society. You say uh, that this habitus, his Caribbean training, is a position from which he conceived his experience of Jamaica and the displacement specific to his social class, the brown middle class, as a mode of vernacular universality or tacit universality. I would like to ask you a question about your own intellectual biography, or should I say your own <laughs> voice? Uh, do you experience this sense of displacement too? And is it the condition that predisposes one of thinking universality? And if so, in which way? What does it mean to think universality from a situated position? Well, that is a very vast question, even though, as you say, it's at a sort of micro level. But I, I, I appreciate the question. And I, I will... I have a, a tendency to evade the questions that I am I am asked. So forgive me if I if if I if if there is a somewhat um, 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 displaced path, let's say, to to answering to answering your question. It's hard, very hard, for me to place a mirror in front of myself and to answer the question about my own situatedness and my own sense of displacements. I think, I think it must be the case that I and um, many people that I know who come from where I come from, where I come from where um, um, when I come from where I come from who who have a similar kind of diasporic experience if you like um, but it is it's 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 tremendously difficult 
for me to narrate that um, in a straightforward biographical voice. So I'm going to, I'm going to I'm going to 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 approach that question again partly through through Stuart and to 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 respond by trying to to think out loud a little bit about what it is I think he enables me to see because that's really what's important about about Hall and for me um, it's it's the sense in which he speaks to me, not simply the sense in which he speaks to uh, um, or, or spoke to a wider world or, or to wider worlds. Um, one of the things that I think, this is what I tried to articulate in that essay, one of the things that I think Hall brilliantly discovered was the sense in which his, the materiality and the historicity of his own displacement could, could constitute a language of universality. That is a language in which one could talk about um, human forms of life as always already living in and living through modes of displacement with multiple mediations, um, a, pl a plurality of vectors and of convergence and divergence through which life is always lived in a certain sense at odds with each other, with, with itself. Um, and for me, whereas for many people, the diasporic, appeared to name a form of local knowledge elsewhere from its origins. For me, the diasporic in Hall's voice was a way of suggesting that the particularity of an historic form of diasporic displacement was metaphorical if you like, for a condition of humanity. And it's that way of thinking, of making his own journey, a very local, a very particular kind of journey, familiar to people like me, but nevertheless, with its own specificities, nevertheless provide not simply a cognitive lens, but an experiential form of being through which a mode of universality could be articulated. Whether or not that's the story of my life, somebody else will have to say. Um, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult for me to turn my reflection on my own um, path to discern whether there are um, um, ways in which I could narrate my own intellectual um, journey as one of displacement, except in this one particular. You know, my, my formative work, scholarly work, was in Sri Lanka. Um, it's, the, it's perhaps the the, the most precise sense in which anybody could really and truly call me an anthropologist. Um, but that, that journey through Sri Lanka was very specifically a journey of displacement. I had been preoccupied with psychoanalysis for many, many years meaning being psychoanalyzed and thinking and reading through psychoanalysis. And one of the things that obsessed me about psychoanalysis was the kind of hermeneutic circle through which the analysand is taken in the process, which is a mode of displacement, right? Um, the transference is a mode of displacing one's libidinal um, 
uh, imaginaries through the therapeutic structure for it to return to oneself in a in a in a in a different form. And Sri Lanka became a way for me of embarking on a journey which was partly mine and partly not, which was a way in some sense of displacing an entire structure of knowledges about the Caribbean and about where the Caribbean is made from, the African continent, the Indian subcontinent in some form, as a way of discerning a, a, a kind of moral elsewhere from which one could look at oneself. I say that at the same time to say that, you know, there's also an intimate personal familial connection to Sri Lanka, but there was no historical, um, uh, no historical, how, how to put this? There was no normative historical story to, to, for me to tell about the making of the Caribbean through the story of Sri Lanka. And therefore it became for me very much a way of being able to displace the presuppositions that I have had about my own social location in Jamaica and to be able to imagine a standpoint from which I could see otherwise than I was seeing. That's a very long-winded way of, of, of trying to respond to the multiple issues inside that, that question that you've asked. So thank you for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question is on how it is on your reflection on the post-colonial anthropologies in uh, other post-colonial places and how we can be researchers in a field between all these tensions in a post bandung area. Uh, the vision and hopes of a new beginning that accompanied the project of Bandung and the formation of new nations after World War II largely collapsed in the 1990s. All this despite anti-colonial movements to overcome Western powers. Um, one of the problems of this time was how could the South grapple with the legacy of the Western modernity that has taken hold to ensure a new radical and sustainable political and epistemological bandung. In your article locating the anthropological subject, post-colonial anthropologists in other places from 1989, you rightly notice that researchers' movement, I quote, are rather one way than the other, that means from the north to the south, and colonial and post-colonial people were are going west. For me, this observation is of interest because my own research takes place in a movement both to the south and to the north. My question therefore is how could a researcher as a, as a post-colonial subject cope with a post-colonial research field? Thank you. You've asked me a, a question which is virtually impossible to answer. Um, it, certainly not in, in, in a in a few words, but it, I, I mean, I, I take the question very seriously. It's the question I ask myself, obviously, in in very many dimensions. So, where to begin? So, let me you you evolve an essay, which which was written when I was finishing my my dissertation, and and when I was as it were, just back from Sri Lanka and trying to think about the implications of that, of the of the modes of um, of of displacement, if you like, the character of that journey. That is to say, someone like myself from Jamaica, um, studying in the North Atlantic in New York, and, um, 
going to um, um, ethical, moral, cultural, and historical elsewhere um, to engage in, a, in an exercise of research, to return in some way to um, the, the global north to finish the dissertation and to then see what my life would be about. Um, and in that in that process, you know, obviously there is a there was a recognition that I didn't obviously look like an anthropologist, first of all, quite straightforwardly. Um, and that many uh, anthropologists from the third world work on their own societies, so to speak. And that was not something that I was interested in doing immediately. I, I was interested in trying to think in other kinds of colonial, post-colonial spaces about the, 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 the specificities of forms of life that had emerged. And to think with one part of my brain about the contrasts between those modes of life and the ones with which I was and am familiar. And if, the, the, <clears throat> if you like, the epistemological structure of knowledge formation was laid bare, the senses in which the, the, the anthropological ego, not simply the anthropological self, the particular individual involved here, but the anthropological standpoint depends hermeneutically on a, on, a, on a European standpoint, right? That goes to a non-European elsewhere to, to, to circle back through and to produce a reflexive, I mean, this is, this is the key point here, right? form of the, 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 the European oppression as a way of enabling a form of knowledge that that runs through that hermeneutic um, circle. It's now telling me that my connection is unstable. I don't know. Um, so I, it, it, it became very important for me to think about my own distinctive location in that paradigm, in that anthropological paradigm. Um, um, and I would try to break out of, from myself, to break out of the paradigm. And for me, one of the things that became very, very important was to try to produce um, an, um, an historical anthropological work formations of, of ritual is what it, it became, that was concerned to look at the entire structure of the anthropological knowledge that produced the practices I was interested in studying. And to, to show the ways in which that anthropological knowledge depended on a whole underground and sometimes not so underground structure of colonial knowledges. So I was interested in a series of practices called Yaktoil, and those practices European and American anthropologists had called demonism. And it puzzled me no end what, what demonism could possibly be. And just scratching the surface of that anthropological knowledge, you could demonstrate quite easily that it was 19th century Christian Protestant missionaries were the first to produce knowledges about these practices and provide the sources through which anthropological, um, that, that anthropological knowledge of these, these practices in Sri Lanka were constituted. So that was my, the particular form of, of that intervention. But that in some way, to widen the terms of uh, responding to your question, it, it has been very important to me, very, very important to me, that people from, uh, from the third world, I intensely the term 
global south or the term third world and the history of that term is for me a very profound one that that folk from the third world imagine journeys that are not simply journeys from the third world to the north atlantic or to europe and the united states but imagine journeys across the third world that that um, that we think about the constitution of networks of conversation that are about rethinking the journey to Bandung, right? The, that is to say, the journey of decolonization from the end of the of the Second World War through the middle to late 1950s, early 1960s, to, to re-examine the 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 not just the not just the the the, the aspirations of the anti-colonialists but the kinds of questions through which anti-colonial discourse was itself produced and in a moment when I, as this is my view what this in a moment when the the vision of the anti-colonialists of the Bandung era has run into dead ends, that our obligation is to re-examine the path to Bandung and the path beyond Bandung. It seems to me that that is a, that is a, 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 um, a responsibility, I want to say almost, a moral and political responsibility of third world intellectuals to, to, to not simply impugn the failures of the post-colonial state, of which there are many, right? Um, but to try the context of our ruin, to re-examine why it is those anti-colonial leaders, including the one that's, that's behind um, Marcus's um, head, why it is they asked the questions they asked. You know, I teach a course on anti-colonialism every year, and we read, we read five texts. We begin with Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. We read um, C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins. We read Emmy's discourse on colonialism. We read Emmy's um, portrait of the colonized and the colonial, and of course Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Dani de la Terre. And one of the things that I am preoccupied with in this course is to deconstruct the assumption that almost everyone in the classroom shares, that these five thinkers had the same understanding of what the problem about colonial power was. And to demonstrate that Gandhi's conception with Western civilization is not James's understanding of what was wrong with colonial power, and not Fanon's understanding of what the problem was of um, of the structures of 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 um, of colonial power, and in this way to try to reopen the story that we tell about what was wrong. With colonial uh, with, a, with the colonial period in order for us a later generation to try to imagine another path not by dismissing the old but by rethinking it thank you thank you so i would like to continue with the questioning of the notion of identity in your book, Stuart Hall's Voice, you quote from one of Hall's essays in which he says, I return to the question of identity because the question of identity has returned to us. Mm. To a certain extent, the same could be said of the question of the universal. It too comes back to us again and again and always poses itself anew. And of course, both questions, the question of identity and difference and the question of the universal are always closely linked. Mm -hmm. Further on in the book, 
you go into Cole's concept of an ethics of generosity, mm-hmm. which you in, which you interestingly do not call, and I quote, an ethics of tolerance or cosmopolitan hospitality, but rather following Cole as, and I quote again, tragic sensibility or tragic disposition in thinking about liberalism and democracy. So I would like to ask you what role such an ethics of generosity could play in the questioning of identity in cultural politics today? So, again, because it's such a vast question, I'm going to um, have to approach it by thinking with the terms that you put on the table uh, in order to find my way. Um, I was always very attached to this idea of identity and returned to him. So, so we had one place to begin with this idea that he returns to identity because identity returns to him. And and what, as a kind of intellectual proposal, is Hall suggesting here about the relationship between concepts and their conjunctures? It's not simply that Hall woke up in the morning and said, what's important is a politics or a theorization of identity. Identity had emerged in a particular way And therefore, it called on a theoretical intervention. Hall once said, I don't know, I can't remember now whether it's in the book, but the thing about him, he was about the concept of identity specifically. The thing about concepts is that they enable us to have a good night's rest. Isn't that beautiful? The thing about concepts is that they enable us to imagine a world stable enough for us to rest peacefully at night. Even though the fact of the matter is that beyond your door, the world is being transformed in all kinds of ways, right? But the thing about concepts is that they enable us to have a good rest. We wake up from that good rest and we have or obliged to re-examine those concepts, to rethink them, etc. And one of those for Hall was the, was the question of identity. And what does Hall mean by that? <clears throat> Hall means that in the in the in the wake of the collapse of um the of actually existing socialism, let's let's say after nineteen after nineteen eighty nine, that the concept of identity had exploded, that the terms of political activity tie in various ways to class formations. No one ever called the working class identitarian, right? Um, it, and, and perhaps in retrospect, we might ask ourselves why that is so. But what emerged in the wake of the dismantling of the assumption that politics could rely on the, the, the central agency of the proletariat to make a new kind of politics, there was a proliferation of new ways of thinking about the relationship and for Hall, as always, thinking through the conjuncture in which he found himself was um, the central impetus to what it is he wanted to think. It's not at all clear to me, for example, that in 2023, that identity as a concept has the same vague uh, 
economies um, might have done at the end of the 1980s and in the 1990s when Hall is thinking about that. There is a sense in which in a contemporary discourse, um, for example, that a conception of life, for example, has displaced the idea of identity. And with the idea of life, the question of the human has been reposed and with it, the, the problematic of identity, of our identity. And with that, of, of thinking explicitly about universality have reemerged and perhaps different conditions in which to think about um, that universality. Which is not to say that I commit myself to all of the um, uh, rethinkings about the human that have reemerged, but but part of the larger, one might even say global condition, I think, for the displacement of the conjuncture of identity and its replacement with a conjuncture of the human and humanity turns on the one hand on the collapse of actually existing socialism and the rise, which I think is tremendously important of what one might call the age of human rights. And I think that we live in a certain sense, whether we like it or not, in a context in which certain conceptions, contestable conceptions of humanity embedded in a rehistoricization of the story of human rights are the condition in which we are now, all of us, no matter where we come, obliged to carry with the between the man and of humanity in relation to our political aspirations, which is not to say that identity is irrelevant, right? I mean, I am I am of the view that um, although I talk quite a lot about the loss of concepts and the gaining of concepts and so on, that's very important to me. It seems to me that it, it it's not that identity has disappeared, perhaps, but that it might be dislocated. There's a lot in your question which I haven't uh, touched on, and I can if you, I could go on. I, I think you can, I think you can continue some of those thoughts and the question that I would like to ask you, um, which, as it were, uh, weaves in another thread of, of, of your work. In, in many of your writings, and, and actually most recently also at your keynote at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt for its uh, reopening, um, which, which some of us attended, you mobilized a particular notion of intellectual traditions, which you described um, in this lecture as discursive regimes of motivated and agonistic and sometimes unceasing argument concerned with pasts assumed not only to be consequential, but also to be a common possession in some relevant embodied community of identity. For you, an intellectual tradition, um, in those words, is therefore not just a constellation of ideas, but a field of rival interpretations and styles of reasoning that make up a distinctive form of life. They are about, and I quote you again, the continuity of modes of inheritance of the authorized past in the present. Now, there are several things that one could unravel that interest me very much. Since I've been interested in working uh, on the possibilities of thinking with Alistair McIntyre's conception of traditions as continuities of argument. Um, but I was especially interested to think about this notion in the context of understanding artistic institutions and traditions. So what I wanted to ask you, especially given that I heard you say this in the context of the reopening of the Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin, and cognizant of your engagement with, of course, the uh, British tradition of cultural studies, I wanted to ask you a question about the role of institutions, um, and in particular, the university on the one hand, and the, let's say, non-museum art site, um, uh, institutions for the production 
um, and reflection on art, um, such as, for instance, Sari Contemporary, which, of course, you also spoke just a few months before. What role do such institutions play in your understanding of intellectual traditions? And what is your hope for, to pick up some McIntyre and thoughts, to ensure their vitality or perhaps to, um, uh, to resuscitate them if need be? Thank you. That's a question which um, goes very directly to commitments of mine. Um, how to think about institutions and 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 um, and in my context, or in several of my contexts, one is talking about vastly under resourced institutions and first of all the survival and the continuity and internal transformability of institutions is to my mind enormously important and I um, um, and one site on which this for me is um, it always in the front of my mind, I will come to institutions like Savvy and so on in, uh, in, in a moment. Project then in institution now is 27 odd years old, um, and it has a certain kind of um, formal organizational administrative. Um, um, structure that depends on sources of funding and labor um, of various kinds and depends on leadership and depends on internal conversations and disagreements and so forth that are partly in the service of the reproduction of an agenda, of a cultural, intellectual, political agenda. And there have been many points along the way in which the project was in deep crisis, um, in which you know we were going to be booted out of one of our of a publisher um, who claimed that we that parts of the one of the issues was pornographic, um, and we had to think about our relationship to the question of intervention. And, 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 and intellectual work. And there were people, colleagues, who took the view that we should abandon any idea of a commitment to continuity and to commit ourselves to the moment of intervention, which is important, right? And an important idea inside of certain kinds of intellectual traditions, right? Of a more kind of guerrilla, mode of operation. And I took a very different view. I took the view that sustaining the platform and finding the means by which to produce a, a, a sustainable, scholarly, artistic, intellectual space for a younger generation than myself to imagine publication was more important than the spectacular politics of guerrilla intervention, right? And so, and so, I had then to ask the question of whether or not this institution should align itself with conventions of academic life, the peer review process. These are deep questions about in, about what an institution is, right? Does an institution conform? What constitutes non-conformity? Where are the borders um, uh, that lie between the, the, the novelty or the creative um, license, so to speak, to produce what one might think of as radical work while sustaining enough of a foot in the, within the paradigm of conventionality that enables one's simple survival. 
And so this question for me of the relationship between continuity and discontinuity is one way of putting it, has always been, always been uppermost. I'll give you another kind of example. Marcus just said in his um, very generous opening remarks that I um, was the curatorial director of the Kingston Biennial, which was a, a great privilege um, and a great honor to, to um, engage. That, that required me to be in a conversation with an institution, the National Gallery of Jamaica, which is in many ways a deeply internally problematic institution. But, it, and, and I won't go into the details here, but, but it, it is an institution to which someone of my generation, and if you like political persuasion, was profoundly committed to. It's an institution that was invented in the, in the 1970s, in the middle of the, of the socialist experiment in Jamaica. And it, it, it imagined itself to be the gallery of the post-colonial nation. And however much the internal administrative difficulties were of engaging this institution in trying to nudge that institution in new directions with, with swallowing what one didn't want to swallow of its, of, its, of its internal modes of operation was important for me in order to realize something that was larger than my own personal uh, discomforts. So I think, in short, I think institutions are fundamental. And I think we don't think enough about the ways in which institutions are themselves conserving, if not always conservative institutions. You have fundamentally to conserve enough to be able to continue. Um, and so I, I have a, I, I wouldn't say an ambivalent, but but a, I, what I think of as a as a as a complicated relationship, um, both one of commitment and of internal participation, and of critique to the institutions that I am involved in. And I would say the same for an institution like Columbia University, um, and 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 various other institutions. And it raises also another question, which, you know, I, I flagged um, at the very end of that um, paper on, on Rodney, which is the question of the political party, which is another kind of institution. And how we rethink the idea of a vanguard party or a party of the left, you know, what are the institutional modes through which one tries to imagine a kind of participation, a kind of leadership, a kind of vision, what discourse animates it, I think are large questions that we are only beginning to try and rethink. Thank you, David. Um. Following our uh, discussion or conversation, I start to, to think about actually proximity and distance, things about like uh, elective affinities, also in a way addressing uh, the institution uh, question, perhaps uh, you just mentioned. In a way, my question is situated in, in this field, and I want to underline a particular constellation. You establish in your book dedicated to your intellectual friendship with Stuart Hall, a concept of the intellectual in the triangle of voice, style, and ethics. You do so in the specific form of an epistolary culture as a series of letters written in the tradition of the essay. This constellation of two names and concepts seems at first hand surprising, but might be promising and productive for critical reflection upon second thought. He opened with a citation by Franz Fanon, 
but not the Fanon who writes about the structural violence during the colonial condition. Instead, you choose a reference in which he says, a quote, the greatness of a man is to be found not in his acts, but in his style, mm. unquote. Later on in uh, the book, you refer to Georg Lukács, mm. but not to the Lukács of history and class consciousness, mm -hmm. or the destruction of reason, as one might think. Instead, you mention the pre-Marxist friend of Leo Popper, the Lukács thinking on the arts still under the sign of idealism and the critic as a platonic figure. Mm -hmm. But form, a category you refer to by way of the traditional dichotomy between form and content, is not really appreciated in post-colonial critique and art production today. So my question is, what place and function is there for style and for a praxis of shaping material or giving form to discourse in post-relativist attempts to reconceptualize the universal and the arts? Hmm. What's the role of form or of style? or of style and form in the reconceptualization of? The universal and the universal. The way in our reflection on this huge problems and doing curation, curational work, reflecting in the- So again, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to begin um, I suppose, in a sense, the, the only way I know how to begin is, you, you know, one of the, I mean, in some ways, at the heart of Stuart Hall's voice is my discomfort with a certain conception of critique. And of, to me, a very worrisome assumption that Critique, it very often stages itself as omniscient, as always knowing better than what is critiqued, right? And, for, and, and, and so part of the, my attempt to, to get around that, to evade perhaps some of the the, the implications of the demand of an idea of critique, which, you know, at the center of which is a, is a substantive idea of reason, of rationality, and perhaps indeed of a standpoint of the universal uh, from which it is able to make claims, truth claims um, of one sort or another. And in some way, for me, the, the, the effort in that book was to find a, um, um, a, to, to, dis, to, to, to find another path around um, around that whole predicament, and to open up a way of thinking about um, how one generates um, um, how one generates. I, I don't know what to call it. Uh, productive conversation, and 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 in the course of uh, my relationship with Stuart, you know, it, and in the kinds of exchanges, and in observing his own relationship across a variety of of um, of engagements, one of the, what struck me startlingly in some respect was the 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 irrelevance, even though Stuart, of course, was a very serious Marxist and therefore a question of reason and critical reason was very important to him. But in the, in the ongoingness of engagements with colleagues, with comrades, with various kinds of networks, students, etc., what emerged to my mind as front and foremost was a style of engagement. And in particular, a dialogical style of engagement. 
and and th that in some sense it was the, the 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 rhetorical forms of the conversational movement of various voices sometimes rival voices that enabled what hall would himself call a kind of pedagogical outcome that we are in a certain sense learning together and we are learning together in disagreement but learning together and that style to to my mind which in written form takes the shape of the essay right that form was to me central to hall's idea of an intellectual life and of a critical life, which is why in that book I used the, the term a listening self, which in some sense stood in a kind of fall in a kind of somewhat competitive relationship to his critical self. But that idea of dialogue, of listening, of paying attention to the rhetorical styles of reasoning, less so than the supposed truth content that my truth is better than yours, more, more superior than theirs, et cetera, that, we're, that, that one has to try to imagine a different way of learning together through our rival commitments, our rival histories, or rival understandings. If that produces um, new ideas of, of universality, I think, you know, so much the better. But but Hall is not interested in that there. You know, he's not, that question doesn't emerge for him. The 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 question that is is for him most crucial and that I admire um, is an attempt to be in an engagement with others such that um, we learn as much how to give as how to receive. And that receiving from others is an incredibly difficult um, operation. We are so structured by our prejudices, which are hardwired in many ways, that it is very difficult to receive from others in such a way that we are able to digest and perhaps even change ourselves, ourselves as individuals. And that seems to me to be important for any attempt to reimagine um, um, universality, to reimagine a political subject, to reimagine an ethical subject. Um, and that capacity of his to live inside of a style of reasoning is to me his most important legacy. I think what is might lead to something a production of a new what we call minor universality, but uh, this said, it's a for me a most important part of the work to be done, intellectual work to be done today nowadays, and and that's for I appreciate it a lot. I love to read really your choice of the citation of the quotation of Vanorio Met in front of the opening of your book. Right. So, yes, it's not a very well known remark of Fanon's that he wrote to his brother. Yeah, I, I, it's it's to me really important. All uh, the quotation. Mm. follow? My question is about the role of literature in your work as a critical thinker. Um, your book Conscripts of Modernity first shed light on Toussaint Louverture as a tragic figure. You wrote Toussaint, I quote, as a modern intellectual who lives the tangled relation between thought and action and with it the conflict of moral options and the negotiations of contingencies. In short, a, a black Hamlet. As a literary scholar, I am impressed by the way you use literary theory to develop a politics of historical imagination. 
Conscripts of Modernity is based on an insightful reading of C.L.R. James's work, The Black Jacobins, first published 1938, a famous rendition of the Haitian Revolution and the birth of the first Black Republic out of a colonial slave society. But of course, your book is also an appeal to post-colonial scholars to change their way to relate to the colonial past and to adopt a tragic mode of history telling. As a mode of narrative employment, you argue, tragedy is more appropriate today for refashioning our political present than the mode of romance, which fosters a romantic longing for total revolution and was, as such, needed in the context of anti-colonial emancipation struggles. So one question is, what is the relation between historiography and literature? And another one is, well, you make a plausible case that a tragic sensibility is needed in today's post-colonial history writing in order to grasp the complexities of enlightenment, but doesn't this also tend to encourage fatalism? Encourage what? Fatalism. Fatalism. Wow. Okay. So, um, you know, I've always thought of myself as a kind of closet literary critic. You know, if I had another life, I, I would, um, and literature has always been um, visual arts as well, but literature perhaps more so, has always been um, central to my way of trying to come at the world in some, um, um, and it, it, you know, it's always been fascinating to me, the number of, of Caribbean intellectuals, including C.L.R. James himself, who was um, a novelist, and a short story writer and the numbers of, of these um, intellectuals for whom genre was always um, multiple, you know, that they're, that they're always involved in blurring genre uh, uh, boundaries. And, um, um, and so the literary and what the literary can do has been very important to me. I'm going to come back to your to, to the questions you raised specifically, but very recently this has been because it turn it bears on the question of universality, which a number of of, of you guys have have raised for me. In a book that's going to be published next year called Irreparable Evil, one of the chapters is a reading of a novel. Again, I can't help myself. Um, a reading of a novel that's not widely known by Orlando Patterson entitled Die the Long Day. And Orlando Patterson, of course, is well known as an historical sociologist, as an, a very eminent historical sociologist, but one of his very powerful novels, the third of his three novels, was an historical novel called Die the Long Day. And one of the characters in the novel is an enslaved woman called Kwashiba. And Kwashiba um, Kwashiba's a slave master on an adjacent plantation wants her only daughter to agree to sex with him. He's not going to physically rape her by violence, or rather he has tried and that has failed, but he wants her to agree. And Kwashiba has tried every which way to persuade the slave master on the, on the plantation where she's enslaved to, to intercede on her behalf, which was not entirely uncommon. He refuses. And Kwashiba decides that the only, the only solution here is murder. Now, one of the fascinating things about this novel is that um, Orlando Patterson is reading who? Albert Camus, The Rebel. 
the center of which is the problematic of murder and its relationship to politics. Kwashiba, but before, I don't want to go into the novel in, in its entirety, but one of the central episodes in the novel is that Kwashiba's lover, a rather um, passive man, lovable in many ways, but relatively passive, tries to persuade her against this course of action that he suspects she's going to take. And she says to him, she, or rather he says to her, you're an enslaved woman. You, there's, there's nothing you can do but accept this predicament. And she says to him, yes, I am a nigger, but I'm also a human and they can only kill me once. Now, I spend a lot of time on this, on this remark in my reading of the novel because it, it does what novels can do. It takes you directly into the heart of the emergence of a conception of universality. Kwashiba's recognition that she cannot be reduced to the specific particularity of enslaved woman. She's larger. She occupies a transcendent position. She is a human being. And as a human being, she can only be killed once. And her action in her attempted murder is an attempt to demonstrate and work out fatally, one might say, tragically, in fact, um, the, the stakes for her in her humanity. Now, the value for me here in a, in a novel like Orlando Patterson's novel or in other novels that I take up seriously is that they are able to evoke a world and they are able to evoke in, the, in a kind of detail that's not available to sociologists, anthropologists, philosophers, dare I say, literary critics, um, that, that, the, that the novel is able to produce a plausible world and is able to produce the nuances of a plausible world that give us insight, not that they are themselves necessarily, um, you know, in, in some naive way, um, a, a kind of realistic window on what the past was, but they give us fictive languages through which to provoke social theory in directions that social theory, I think on its own, would not necessarily be able to um, articulate. And this particular novel, Die the Long Day, is in some sense um, the, the, the companion to Orlando Patterson's Sociology of Slavery, which was published a few years before. So they are in some sense intertwined. And to my mind, thinking about one in relation to the other gives one a radically um, um, enhanced, a, a, a radically more complex pic picture of, of human relations, of, of human motivations, of the nature of um, the, the, the complexity of human action in particular. I mean, I am, I mean, one of the things that I am much preoccupied with, and it comes out of thinking about the tragic, is the idea of action and refusing to reduce action to something like agency, that one has to think about action in its micro um, 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 uh, contingencies and, and, in, and in its micro situatednesses. I mean, this is partly why Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition is a sort of valuable work for me, however much in many contexts I disagree with Hannah Arendt, but her attention to action and therefore to time is captured most more, more vividly 
in the context of fiction. I mean, poetry to me does other things, and 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 theater or drama do, do do other things. But but the thing about fiction is its temporal character, and the way in which it captures action evolving in time. So so that's to, that's for me the you know the the beauty of fiction. You know, I I always say in order to provoke literary critics, um, that when I say this, that I'm not a literary critic and I know nothing about literary criticism, I know nothing about the, the value, the, the aesthetic value of fiction or anything like that, but, the, but that this is what, to my mind, um, fiction enables an attention to time, action, subjectivity. It allows us to attend to the complex nexuses in which individuals find themselves, are motivated, are blocked in their actions, have to think again or make determinations that in sometimes in tragic form, they cannot undo. And there is something enormously important for us to learn about um, the way in which action emerges and is propelled in those ways. I don't know. There was another part to your question, which I, yeah, that was the one part, the relationship between literature okay. and... Thank you for this magnificent answer to, to the first question. And uh, <laughs> the second one, it, it's difficult when there are two questions and encapsulated. And and um, the other one was on the necessity uh, for today's post-colonial history writing to develop um, a sense of tragic a tragic sensibility mm -hmm. in order to 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 be able to grasp the complexity of enlightenment and as you demonstrated for example in your rereading of james's work but um, if postcolonial history writing goes this way wouldn't it oh. tend to encourage fatalism yes. fatalism yes uh, so so it, it is, I acknowledge, um, you know, I have been, I have been often characterized, I might say in my own defense, mischaracterized as, um, um, a, a, as, as fatalist. And I, I'm not entirely sure always what that means. Um, and I've, I've often, this has often been a characterization, not so much at conscripts of modernity as, uh, as at um, omens of adversity, which is my redescription of the, the, the collapse of the Grenada Revolution, and in which, again, there is a novel at the center of it, um, Merle Collins' novel Angel, uh, which is, a, which is a, a, an amazing novel. Um, so yes, you know, there is a sense in which, um, to use a phrase of George Steiner, um, George Steiner is not somebody that a lot of contemporary critics read anymore. And that's one of the things I love to do. I have to say, I, I enjoy reading, um, authors that people have abandoned. Um, I, I enjoy reading texts of authors that are often, you know, like Lukács, texts that are no longer part of the, the canon of reading of a particular author. There's something to me very generative about that. And George Steiner is not, a, at least in the US Academy, not, not much loved um, um, thinker. But in his book on, on tragedy, George Steiner says poignantly, I think, that Oedipus does not get his eyes back. He doesn't. And, and this is part of the point about action. And in some sense, again, to, if you want to follow Arendt and behind there somewhere is Weber, that, that, that action has consequences that we cannot always control and we cannot always reverse. And therefore the question of failure 
in relation to action is enormously important to think about and to learn from. To my mind, you know, one of the problems about revolutionary action, one of the problems about revolutionaries of a slightly older generation than me is that is a refusal to think about failure and to think about the ways in which failure and the possibility of failure is itself an internal structural possibility of action, full stop. So, you know, I re-describe the unfolding of the actions involved um, in the Central Committee of the New Jewel Movement um, during the crisis of the Grenada Revolution. And I re-describe this as a clash of actions that came to a tragic pass. Now, is that fatalist? Well, I, you know, it is, it is in part the fact of the matter, right? That, that, the, that the crisis unfolded to a, to a, to a, a breaking point where um, there was violence and people were killed. Now, what's important to me is not that I don't believe that this was the, the necessary preordained course that the action had to take. What interests me is a redescription of the, of the action such that we can pay attention to those, those points of crisis and those points of seeming irre irreversibility such that the actors felt as they did that there was no other way out. And in my view, there is something that we, all of us who come in the wake of that um, terrible historical conjuncture can learn from rethinking that moment in terms of those impasses that appeared to the actors as blockages that they could not get around. Why did they think so? What was the nature, a friend of mine in Dar es Salaam and I were talking about this, what is the problem about democratic centralism that, that, that fed a conception of party obligation um, that fed the idea that this was the principled form of, of action. So, you know, obviously, um, Hegel's phenomenology is in, you know, is, is, is in my head here as I think about this. Um, that, that, that the nature of a certain kind of action that appears to the participants as right, as absolutely principled and right, that cannot be renegotiated, that cannot be opened up for um, disagreement. And again, you know, in, 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 my, in the earlier uh, response, it's why Stuart Hall's idea of the, the dialogical um, is so important for, for how one rethinks the idea of the political. But it's that that interests me. I disagree that I think that there's that, that action is preordained, if that's what fatalism means. I don't believe that we, um, or this, this may be a more complicated question, that we are fated. I think that there are, that's, that's deep, and we can, we can talk about that if, if that's a direction you want to go in. But um, it, I, don't, I don't believe that my conception of the tragic is, is fatalistic. I want to argue that failure and complexes that appear to have been insurmountable have to be examined not simply in terms of, you know, what, why didn't they make this political decision as opposed to that political decision if they had been more democratic or something like that, they could have resolved the problem. I don't want to return the language of criticism to the internal language of Marxist dispute about how to make the revolution. I want to displace that and look at the action in terms of what the action complexly led to and face up to the fact that what it led to was defeat and failure and how to think about failure as a form internal to every engagement of action. 
Well, thank you so much, David. Um, not only one feels the passion when it comes now to literature and from where you develop um, such a fundamental thought, I think, which really is into the, the core of, of what we think about so often and talking, reading texts and talking about them. And it, it opens so many windows to many things we have been thinking about, like Rancière's reading of Auerbach, right? Where he says that basically in the novel, every, in the modern novel, every non-important single moment could be the appearance or as you had it, the transcendence of this human that you described so impressively through through the novel uh, and the decision of of this uh, enslaved woman, you know, to to be only able to be murdered once and to to be human through that. So that is really is is fascinating, but really in a very deep sense. In that um, when you say it's world making, literature can create a plausible world. Uh, I think no literary critic could deny that. And when you say um, that uh, they can think whatever about, I would be with you very much and say that, yes, this is really into the heart of what the novel can do. It can, through its aesthetics, through the way it produces the perception of world, um, it can produce these moments uh, where we get conscious of something. And that is another thing. You didn't say the word, but I always, when I read your texts, I have the impression there is something I'm very interested in, and that is consciousness. It is a, a word that has completely disappeared from what we all say, I mean, in, in academia at the moment, because it's it's not the body, it's not embodied, you know, it's not our outer appearance. It's And you even, I mean, you even came back to, to Hegel's phenomenology. I found that so wonderful, um, because of course about that, about world making and about um, the fact that in a novel also there is a consciousness in the novel, but also ourselves linked with a certain specific specificity of time, of a moment, and being conscious of that. And I, I always feel that there is one really Benjaminian um, thing in that, uh, in what you're always interested in all of your inquiries, is that there is a point in time in which we are standing which we try to link these pasts and the readings of them with which, you know, how we could co get conscious of how how to develop a future we can't see. Because as you say, I mean, this is the old Greek, the, the what we learn from the Greek tragedy um, that we see only afterwards, right? I mean, this is the, as you said, I mean, Oedipus is, is acting and then you know only after he can't see anymore he sees that's basically so that absolutely. so that's tragic of course and and we are into that but i liked so much that you say it is a struggle of consciousness also to 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 be to have a sort of awareness at a point where we stand and where we try to link these these pasts with the future and this brings me a bit back now to a a last um, maybe also general question, which is very much linked to your um, young work, because you already raised or mentioned your uh, book that will come with Columbia Press uh, very soon on the irreparable evil, um, and you call it an essay in moral and reparatory history, and that is something we are also very interested here, and we are also already looking forward to reading you more, but from what I read on Walter Rodney in that is that there is exactly this attempt in a philosophical way now to understand how a utopian view of revolution, let's say, of what revolution can bring, and of course, what, what was at the core of the idea of socialism to produce a future, a more human future, and the idea of reparation. And I say it in the singular because it's not only about economic reparations, much more as far as I read you also concerned with the self and with subjectivity and and how we can repair our views of ourselves and the history, uh, historical experience we have. H how can that be linked? And I, I would really love you to, to say something about this idea of repair and reparation and how that could be not a conservative, a notion, but something that is also linked to these futures that we try to think about, um, and and I would love you know to to see how how, how you how um, you explain more radically this idea of repair actually. 
Mm. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that impossible question. Um, so, you know, the question about consciousness, I think, it, I, I think we can't think politically without returning in some form to the idea of what we want to do with consciousness. However much it is mediated and fractured by, you know, everything that everything that's happened theoretically since the abandonment of the idea of consciousness and the um, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago and, and, uh, and it's possibly return. I think we can't think um, uh, normatively as well as descriptively. So, uh, so it, it's something that I think um, little by little is coming back into my, my own vocabulary. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, that I can produce easily an account of the problem of reparation as uh, um, spelled out and articulated in irreparable evil. Um, the, the book has many, many permutations, including a long um, rediscussion of um, Hannah Arendt's totalitarianism book um, and the way in which the death camps emerge as a kind of in counterpoint specifically to slavery, which is not very often not recognized or remembered in that amazing book of hers. But one of the, again, you know, one of the, um, you know, it's a, it's a peculiar feature. I don't know, I, I, I'm hoping that I'm getting over it now, maybe I'm growing up, that many of my books end with Hannah Arendt and, and Irreparable Evil does too. And as much as I disagree and in various parts, but there's a, a again, a style of reasoning, a style of, of discomposing, I don't know what else to call it, reason of hers, a, a, a style of irritation in her writing that I admire. And one of the, one of the moments that again is not often thought about in the human condition is her attempt to, to direct our attention to kinds of atrocity. Obviously, um, the Shoah is for her the be all and end all of atrocity, but kinds of atrocity, radical evil, that do not admit of either punishment or forgiveness. They cannot be punished because they cannot be forgiven. And they cannot be forgiven because they cannot be punished. And that in some sense captures for me something very important about the, 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 the untranscendable character of certain kinds of horrific pasts. And the Shaw and New World slavery were both atrocities, very different kinds of atrocities with different kinds of, of afterlives. But they are afterlives that are just that, persisting, untranscendable afterlives. And in that sense, they are, or that's one of the senses in which, for me, New World slavery is irreparable, is irreparable. Another sense in which it is irreparable, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't commit ourselves to practices of repair, right? Practices of reparative response. But one of the things about New World Slavery that, and, and it forms another of these chapters, which is a rereading of Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, is that what New World Slavery produced was not simply isolable wealth that was taken by 
individuals or deposited in museums, etc. What was not discrete, calculable kinds of wealth. What New World slavery produced was the generalized wealth of the modern world. This is Eric Williams' point in Capitalism and Slavery, that it, it produces um, the, the grounds for, the emer or one of the central pillars for the emergence of capitalism. And therefore, there is no calculable, measurable way in which to say to the descendants of the enslaved, this is what is owed. We have calculated it here, and this is what can be paid to you. Every person like me who walks through a European city walks on the ground produced by what CLR James in the preface to the Black Jacobin said was produced by the labor, talking about Saint-Domingue, of half a million slaves, right? And it, it's in that sense that these atrocities or this particular radical evil is to my mind irreparable. However, however, the, the, the part of the moral point about an orientation of repair is that it does something to my mind which revolutionary rationalities didn't adequately do. It demands that we live through the senses in which the past pervades the present. It demands that we think again about the way in which um, some pasts are not past, right? And that they live in ghost-like ways in the present. And that we probably can't simply get away from them, that we have to find ways of living together with pasts that we cannot transcend. So one of the things about reparation for me, and, I, and here I depart very, very uh, acutely from what I characterize both in the Rodney lecture and in the book as a kind of liberal legalistic reparatory um, rationality, that for me, a reparatory um, orientation, a reparatory historical sensibility alerts us, again in a tragic way, to the fact that there are some pasts, some histories that we live um, that are uh, atrocities of a form that, again, we can't simply put behind us. We can't. Now, to my mind, and this is what, this is the direction of the, of the Rodney essay, which is not really part of the book, but is um, my trying to respond to some of my critics in some way, who say that I want to get rid of um, um, uh, the, an idea of revolution, which is not, which has never been the case. But the point for me is to, is to, is to think these a reparatory um, orientation and a revolutionary orientation as not reducible to each other. They depend on different conceptions of past and the present. They depend on different conceptions of temporality. They depend on different ways of thinking about the relationship between action and its implications. And we have to be able, in order to think forward, to be able to conjugate these, a reparatory orientation and a revised revolutionary orientation in ways that don't seek to produce a homogeneous, monological way of thinking the future in the present. So that, that is part of a project which is only um, in very elementary forms for me trying to you know, work my way through what I disagree with in, in the rep reparatory um, justice literature, what I disagree with in the literature on revolution, and how we might think again about plausible ways of demanding alternative futures than the ones we inhabit. And that's the task. 
Thank you so very much, David, for this engagement <laughs> and for being in dialogue with us. I mean, we took you on a wild ride through <laughs> many disciplines and also th through your own pasts, which sometimes I guess must be very strange to, you know, get back to articles you write some 40 years ago and then you have, you know, to have a comment on that and to replace it. And, and thanks so very much for, you know, allowing us to do that because we have been reading you carefully and a lot and um, had so many questions and you gave us really substantial answers also linked to um, yeah two fundamental concepts we are turning around here with the group uh, new forms of universality but also this uh, problem or question rather of repair and, and reparation and how it can be linked to futures um, because of the irreparable, irreparable so thank you so very much it was absolutely fascinating and um, fortunately enough the technique also played uh, better and better so um, that was just wonderful thank you so much and I you need to come to Saarbrücken where we start this project on cultural practices on repair because you're so deeply into that and we need your wisdom and knowledge about that thank you so much for for being with and, us and thank you guys very very much for inviting me into this conversation it's yeah. always um, a treat to be um, for for questions to be posed to one that you, you know you haven't anticipated, you you have to, as it were, think on your feet and think out loud, and it's always a a complicated pleasure. So thank you all very very much. Thanks to you. It was impressive. <laughs>